Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. I'm sitting with my best friend, Tony. What's up, buddy? What's going on, brother? Uh, you know, we were just chatting with our guest today, and um, I mentioned that for the first time in a long, long time, we've done um, about 450 episodes, and today I'm a little nervous, man, for the first time in a really long time. It was funny because, uh, yeah, I mean, because we want to honor this family, but, you know, you're you're nervous even before today, you know, and just I could tell you're excited, you're excited, your yeah. excitement, you know, yeah. with our guest today. <laughs> I'm really excited about our guest today. It, it took about it took it took about two years to kind of like uh, uh, get her on the podcast, but I'm really excited about it. Um, today on the podcast we have Miss Beverly Sassoon. Beverly Sassoon is the the former wife of of the legend Vidal Sassoon, and um, and uh, we haven't told we haven't told Beverly yet, but um, you know, like this conversation, like I I think I think Vidal's legacy is so like is so a part of our industry um and, and we've talked about it the leg uh, we've talked about his legacy and just just you know who he is to the industry and i know michael gordon did an amazing documentary mm -hmm. michael gordon michael gordon did yeah. an amazing documentary that you can see on prime that's called um vidal sassoon the movie um you know he honored the the legend of vidal sassoon but you know today in our conversation i'm hoping that we can really talk about the man i'm i'm interested in and and what Beverly's relationship with with the man, not necessarily the, the legend, like the, like the legend has been cemented in our industry, and I kind of really get to know who the man is. I want to know about his insecurities. I want to know about about you know what what was his driving force. I want to know about you know who who the man was. And 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 this is no shade on Eden, but when we had her on a couple years ago, you know, um, she very much and rightfully so is a doting daughter. So you know, it, it's it, it just kind of built into that legacy. And and I'm hoping we can get a little bit uh, deeper with um with Miss Beverly. Yeah, and you brought up Eden. We want to thank Eden. Eden, thank you so much for uh, sharing your family and uh, allowing uh, us to get closer to you guys. And we really really appreciate you. Absolutely. We have a big family. You could keep going, you know. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to. We will once we talk to them. Right, so. Okay. So, Miss Beverly Sassoon, welcome to your day off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you guys. Good to see you. Beverly, where'd you grow up? I was born in Canada. And um, my father had been in the era, U.S. Air Force, Army Air Force there and met my mom. And then I don't know why, but they headed south to Burbank, California, and that's where what I grew that? up. What was, mm -hmm. was that in Burbank? What's in Burbank? No, no. When did they come to Burbank? When I was eight, so that was a while ago. I'm telling you, 70 years ago. Wow. So, yeah, I'm kind of thinking, like, what was industry in Burbank? Was It, it was just the movies then, wasn't it? Just the, just the films, and there was a Lockheed. You know, and my dad had worked in, in uh, like a, a hydraulic lab technician and where they made valves and things for, for airplanes. And so he worked with Lockheed for a while. And then with another, they lived in the same little house that they bought whenever I was eight. So let's see, 45, 40, 53, mm -hmm. um, until they passed away 11 years ago. And it was just the sweetest thing i mean talk about having a base you know that was that was my wow. that was my own base so were Just you me, mom and dad are you a dual citizen is that no you know i i was uh by the time i was 18 years old um i was under contract to columbia pictures and um i i don't know i nobody told me that i could be one you know, so but when I when I was uh, under contract at the studio, they wanted to send me uh, to Brazil to do a movie uh, with Mike Connors and Dorothy Provine, and 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 I didn't have a passport, so I got a, an and then they just rushed it through the the U.S. 
you know, in the studio. And I became an American, got a passport and left the country all in about 24 hours. So nobody mentioned anything about Canada. <laughs> but, Holy cow. Um, I like being an American, but I like saying from, from Canada. So Of course. I mean, I, to, we're not that far different. They're kind of like it's almost the same. Oh, you mean Canada and in the U.S.? Yeah. 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 Well, except here us on the East Coast now, you know, we're getting covered in smoke. We're getting covered in Canadian smoke. I know. I'm so sorry. I'm such a, <laughs> such a people pleaser. I'm so sorry <laughs> for our smoke. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's very Canadian there. So how, yeah, it is. <laughs> how did you end up in the movies? Um, I did. Let me think. I, I, uh, there was a, a teenage, like a, there's a recreation center in Burbank. It was called Pickwick park and pickwick equestrian center and i got a job i worked at the little shop where they sold clothing and ice skates and bathing suits you know in the summers and there was a tv show like a teenage dance party show that originated from that park and they used to have me model the clothes or the ice skates or whatever it was you know from that little shop and one one week, uh, somebody called in and said, we want to talk to that girl that with the flip, you know, it's like real all American um, about doing a commercial. Uh, and it was a commercial for RC Cola with um, Art Linkletter. Okay. And I went, OK, that's me. You know, mm -hmm. I was a real Valley girl at the time, did the commercial with Art Linkletter and that very day met. Um, Ozzy Nelson, remember from Ozzy and Harriet show? Yeah, yeah. And he said, I got a script I'd like you to read. I mean, it sounds all just like it kind of felt like it happened very quickly like that. And and then I it just it just kind of stumbled into other parts. So I guess a combination of being in the right place at the right time. And it wasn't brain surgery, you know, in those days. You know, they were cute little parts nothing real heavy and, and serious. And now as 18, I was under contract to the studio for seven years and uh, went to school there, worked there. You know, there are some interesting people that were in our, our, our class, as they call it. It was the old contract, contract days at the studios. There's about seven of us under contract. And this was in the 60s. And Stephanie Powers, remember Stephanie Powers? Oh, well, for sure. Yeah, and so she was there, but she was more advanced in her work and her everything than, than the rest of us. And we used to have to study together. You know, everybody had to do our, our scenes and our homework for our classes. And there was one guy in our class that that had two kids and he couldn't afford to go out for dinner to or, or, or study. So we'd take our dinners and we'd go to this young man's house and we'd all rehearse, you know, and he would always moan and groan because Stephanie got jobs. I got jobs. He didn't get jobs. Mm -hmm. Stephanie got, you know, and he kept going on and on. The girls are cute. You know, that's why you work all the time. They don't give guys jobs at the studios. Well, his name was Harrison Ford. No <laughs> way. <laughs> yes. And I, at one point, year a couple of years later, I was in England doing a movie, and I heard that he got a, a job. It was called American Graffiti, and I sent him a note saying, "Thank goodness you finally got a job. Stop complaining." You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was a cute, it was a cute story, and that was kind of the end of the contract player stage. And oh, those... so, so Harrison, like he's like. He's legendary for like his sense of humor and stuff. Did you find him to be funny? Yeah, he's he's adorable. He's funny. He's dry wit, you know. Yeah, no, he's he's just a really good guy. I mean, he's a carpenter that got very lucky or an actor that loves carpentry. I don't know. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's like he's like the second biggest carpenter of all time. If you. uh you Yeah, know, really. <laughs> can you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> So those were early days. That's um, amazing. Hey, so I the, the one question that I've been sitting on for a month to ask you, like, were you in a couple movies with Elvis? I was. I was. They were little parts because the movies that he did when he started doing those movies, aside from unless you were Ann Margaret or somebody, you know, you, there were lots of girls and like, kind of like little cute roles. Um are you going where I think you're going with this? I don't know. I don't. No, 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 no. I'm just you. Tell your story. Oh, but did, 
so no, I I got to meet him. I mean, he was he was lovely. It was again, I was maybe in my teens, but all these years kind of passed, and I now live. My neighbor upstairs is Priscilla. Really? No, no, I didn't know that at all. Oh, okay. I oh, thought you were going wow. there. How is she doing? It, ha it happened it's so funny because we, we met over the years and she was doing acting and then I was married to Vidal and she was married to Elvis and we both kind of went our separate ways and somehow or other in the last year or so, we've ended up as, as neighbors, I mean, directly neighbors and become really good friends. I adore her. She's, we have a, she said to me, you know, what's really interesting is that we have a lot of similarities in our lives, especially now. Mm -hmm. um, but she said, you know, Vidal was kind of the Elvis of the hair world. And that came coming from her. That was that was kind of a nice compliment. And she knew Vidal. Um, so it's it's funny how life just kind of takes you on these little cruises. Well, I didn't I didn't know about Priscilla. So this is breaking news for us. But I said. <laughs> I, you know, the joke I, I, I wrote a month ago was that, you know, you've been in the room with the two Kings, you know, and like, you know, the, the King of rock and roll and the King of hairdressing. So, uh, so yeah. hey, Priscilla, yeah, on a personal note, how's she doing? She's doing okay. Uh, she is one strong woman. I, the day that she lost her daughter, I was sitting exactly where I'm sitting now. And I had the TV on and I heard, you know, what had happened. And I picked up my phone and texted and said, please tell me this isn't true. Because sometimes people say, and her cousin texted me back and said, it is. And just went, oh, my heart sank because it's like what happened with my daughter, you know, the similarities. And the girls knew each other and they went to the same school at one point. Um, so there's a lot of similarities in our, in our lives. And I don't know how helpful I was for her because it's really difficult. I know when I lost my daughter, people kind of didn't know what to say, you know, and it, so they didn't say anything. They kind of just drifted around me and, 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 I, and you feel very alone, you know, but she's, she's really, and it hasn't been that long, you know, but she's, she's really She's strong. Wow. It's, it's a, it's a, there's, there's just no, as a parent, you know, you, you pull out their clothes to go to school and to bring them home from the hospital, you know, not for their funeral. So it's, it's something that it's, a, you hear it. It's a club that you don't want to join yeah. that, you know, well, you know, here it, we are today and more and more people, are joining, you know, that especially now with the problems with, you know, some of the, the drugs that are out on the streets today no, yeah. and whatever. So that that's life. And what we do is just get up and, and go on to the, to the next step. Yeah, for sure. I, I didn't mean to bring it down or no, down. No, 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 no. So as, as a young girl, um, or a woman, I should say, as a young woman. My little grandson, can you see him? So, oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. He oh, killed yeah. me for this now. He's now 17. <laughs> I'm that's sorry, as a young girl. Do, no, it's good. As a young woman, uh, you know, you, uh, and then you get to star in a, in a show, even if it's a small part with Elvis. I mean, and you said there's a lot of girls, uh, a lot of women there. Uh, were everybody like kind of going crazy? I mean, obviously he was like a, like a, like the heart throb, like even my wife was born in 1973. And uh, even as a young girl, even though he was way beyond his prime, he would, she would watch his young movies. She would ha have crushes on, on Elvis, you know, I oh, sure. but how was even older women do did, you know, I mean, he was, there was something just that he had the it factor, you know, and on the set, um, everybody tried to be cool. You know, he kind of like didn't want to Google, you know, and go oh, there. But he was so pleasant. And this is speaking just from my experience. He was so pleasant to everybody on the set and kind. And it was yes, ma'am. And no, sir. And thank you, sir. And and just that was just who he was that during the time that I was there, that you felt like he was just one of the 
you know, one of the folks. Not and necessarily he, the star that just like, like in the cast. Yeah. He was very, he, he was lovely to everybody. I mean, of course, after this movie came out, we saw that there were lots of different sides to him. Sure. Um, but sure. I love that film. Did you, obviously you oh. saw it. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a big Elvis fan. I mean, I'm a I'm a big fan of um I'm a big fan fan of like foundation music. So you know, from Johnny Cash to Elvis Presley, oh, yeah, to, to all of you know, like I, I just I I I. I, I I, I love that stuff. So, um, you know, since I was a kid, you know, my dad had eight tracks of of, of Elvis Presley. And that, <laughs> that was the soundtrack of my childhood. Was you know Elvis on eight track. You know, so. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah, I it, love that. It, it's how really, many people really, know what eight track is? Right. Oh no. You know what I, I remember <laughs> is if we reminisce for just a sec. I remember being a kid and like my dad's like car filled with like eight tracks because he actually had an eight track player in the car. You know, it wasn't just in the house. But yeah. You know, these big heavy yeah. like because uh cartridges you know and then we went to cassette and stuff and then it was easy you know but yeah that's that's can i tell you a funny little story please my dad my dad you said your dad videl had a car and um this was back in the 80s maybe and and it had a thing to put in the middle of it for the eight track cartridges you know and then you just put them in there in the car so he was out one day having a lunch with some friends and he 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 was a little Mr. Magooish, okay, at times when it came to driving cars or certain things, he was just kind of out there a bit. <laughs> and um, but in a sweet, endearing way. So anyhow, he he comes home and he gets out of his car and he comes into the house. He said, I can't believe what's going on in the world these days. Somebody told stole my eight tracks. They took my eight tracks, they're all gone. And about two minutes later, somebody knocks on the door and it was a guy from the restaurant that he'd just been at. And he said, Mr. Sassoon, we're so sorry, but you have Zsa, Zsa Gabor's car. <laughs> <laughs> so I went, oh, I'll come to, awfully sorry. Oh. And I, <laughs> he, they gave him a white, whatever it was, and he got in it and drove it home, not realizing that it wasn't even his car. Oh. But um, but that was our eight track story. So he got his eight tracks back and she got her car back. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a pretty good track. Zsa Zsa Gabor. It takes me back when I was 10 years old. Uh, uh -huh. She showed up at the this mall uh, signing autographs or, or, you know, whatever she was doing. And I remember being 10 and just like all of a sudden just like fell in love. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah, it was Zsa Zsa Gabor. And, she was your uh, first crush? Yeah. Yeah. I was like. Is that cute? Yeah, she was so yeah, she was so stunning. And uh, but it was, it was the, the, whole, the sisters, yeah, with the yep. big jewelry. Yeah, all, all the jewelry, exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so how did you how did you how did you and Vidal meet? Oh, um the day after I turned 21, and it really was the day after. I had a 21st birthday party my roommates had for me. And then right from the birthday party, they drove me to the airport to um, to go to England. I was scheduled to do a movie. And, you know, the studios kind of book you and, and then tell you about it later. Mm -hmm. And it was a, um, a film that was starring Jack Palance and Burgess Meredith. And some really fine English actors. So I was thrilled to be included in that, you know, crowd. And it was written by a man who wrote Psycho, which okay. was a man named Robert Block. And so it was, it was kind of, it's turned into a culty film. It's still around. It's called Torture Garden. Oh. <laughs> and um it was uh it was fun. It was it was a whole lot of fun working with them, but what while I was there, the, the Columbia Pictures said, you know, we have a, a newspaper story we want to do on Beverly Adams goes to England, you know, Valley Girl, and then Beverly Adams goes mod. So they brought over, you know, mini skirt by Mary Quant and these clunky shoes and, of course, boxes of wigs from a, the Sassoon Salon and then put all these different wigs on. We found one that we used for the story and the the young man that was trying the wigs on said, you know, my name is Joshua. And he said, I work at Bond Street if you ever want to come in. And I don't know how he took, I had to take it because I think he was implying my hair sucked. 
people <laughs> who like to come in and have a haircut here's my card you know um and so i did i went in and there wasn't much they could do to my hair because it was in the middle of a filming so you had to keep the continuity going um and while i was there a gentleman came over and tapped me on the shoulder at the at the salon he said i understand you're over here doing a film and if there's anything we can do to make you stay more comfortable please let us know and, and by the way mr sassoon would like to have a look at your hair when you're finished i didn't know who that was i was raised in burbank fashion news traveled really slowly to burbank okay so i remember being taken up four flights of stairs um to be introduced to somebody and that that's how we met. He stepped out of his office and was like doing one of these, kind of looking at my hair, which was all. What I didn't know is that every young, attractive girl that, you know, came into the salon, you got a tap on the shoulder from somebody and say, Mr. Sassoon would like to have a look at your hair. And then I go, and your hair and your hair. <laughs> and so There's a lot had, of girls had, going up those. Going there, up. there was a lot of traffic, but that was an expensive tap. So um, <laughs> we were engaged shortly after that. So wow. where uh, where did he take you on your first date? We went to, um, it was really strange because I don't know if he didn't have a car, but his friend had well, a he car. He had Zaza's car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but his friend had a car. So he and his friend picked me up. I was staying at a hotel in London and and they we went to um it was it was a hotel where Sammy Davis was performing. And so it basically was like the four of us, me and the three guys. There's Gerard Austin, who was went worked with Vidal and Sammy and Vidal and myself. And we just kind of chit-chatted and had a bite to eat. And then Sammy went to perform. And that was it was a, an interesting date, you know. Right. And then this then he was asked me out for a second time. And he stood me up. So that was that was not a no, high on my, he didn't get much point. A, how did he get a third date if he stood you up at the second date? Really? Um he it, first of all, I quickly learned that here was a man that knew more about the way I should look than than I did. You know, I mean it was like my clothes were wrong, my I was very self-conscious. You know, my hair obviously wasn't up to London's, you know, standards. My makeup was wrong. And so I was, I just didn't, you know, I, I didn't feel real comfy. And I was constantly redoing myself before the date or whatever. I put a lot of energy into that second date. <laughs> and then I get a phone call saying, oh, I'm so sorry. Mr. Sassoon can't make it tonight. He's in the hospital. What? And I thought, well, if he isn't, he's going to be. I mean, <laughs> I was pissed. You know, I thought, who does this guy think he is, you know? And and he did. He had an appendicitis attack, and they operated on him. And uh, and then I felt badly, and I went to visit him. And that was that was it. When he came out, we started dating, and and it was it was kind of love at first sight, you know. Oh, so good so, luck telling your parents that, though. So you're dating. Not a, not across the Atlantic, but across the Atlantic and across the whole country, you know. A thousand you, miles, yeah. Because you were in Burbank, and he's in London, right? What a combo! Right? <laughs> Did you? I, I had I called my parents, you know, because um, we literally met like in November, the end of November, and he proposed to me in December. So, yeah. I know now that now, I mean, I can hardly say anything to my kids about stuff that they do after that. <laughs> um, but here, when I called my parents and I said, I met this wonderful man, you know, and of course, in their mind, they're hearing, wait, he's our age, not her age. You know, I he was yeah. six years younger than my mom. Um, he's Jewish. They raised me Catholic. In those days, you know, that was meant, I don't know, I guess it meant something, but apparently not to us. And it was a hairdresser, you know, that that really, they they had hoped for something different. 
for me. My dad, you know, worked in a a factory and they just had hoped for a better life for their only child. Um, So Vidal flew those 6,000 miles to come and and visit my, and meet my parents because surely that would make everything better. Those days in England, they were wearing those fat, short ties. Do you remember seeing them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those short, what did they call them? There was a name for them. They'll, I don't know, kippers or something. (laughs) Something strange. But um, he came to visit and sat with my parents. Well, actually, he didn't sit with my parents. He sat in the living room, and my mother refused to come out of the bedroom to meet him. So that that was our start of our relationship (laughs) with my family. Whoa. Well, 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 after, after what well, did your mom finally come out? No, she did not. She never came out. No, she's still there today. No, I'm <laughs> she's, she didn't. She just didn't think he was right for me. You know, I mean, I get it, but she could have done it a different way. Anyhow. So we did that normal thing that anybody would do. And we called Buddy Hackett and we went to Vegas and got married. <laughs> <laughs> did Buddy Hackett marry you? Uh, he called a judge and we he got a suite for us and everything. He was performing, I think, at the Dunes, you know. Um, and he said, Come on up. Vidal knew him from be, you know, from before. And but he said, Come on up. And we went we went up there and and that was it. We got married. So are you the reason why he came here to to the New Hair? States? To Vidal? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. He actually had an an interesting story. He actually had one salon in New York and he was brought over from England um, by a company called Charles of the Ritz. And Charles of the Ritz owned a number of cosmetic companies. I mean, Charles of the Ritz and Yves Saint Laurent and and lots of other companies And, and he had a salon with them um, on Madison Avenue, like in the 60s, 66, 67th Street. I'm not sure. It was a while, while back. And and Vidal wanted to, after we got married, he, he, he wanted to, I remember the day where he said, I have to figure out a way to support my family without using these. Because... Mm. If he used his hands, you know, that's when he got paid. And so he, he that was something that he really, really kind of pondered and decided that the, well, schools, schools were a good part of his business. At one point, you know, people would come from all over the world to, to go to the school, but the salon business is not really big, big money maker. You know, it's great as a as a flagship, right? Um, but Vidal, our whole thing when we were together was built. We didn't talk about products, or we did books together and whatnot. But um, was about a healthy lifestyle, and that's what he was. So he proposed to me at a health farm. That should say something. <laughs> oh, wow. So was it was he like a because later on wasn't he like a, a vegetarian or he was like kind of like doing like the Jack Lalonde thing? Like, oh, he no, he ate meat and um, but he was I mean, really into the wheat germ and and yogurt and just all the healthy drinks and and running and jogging and and he was you know, people used to call it back then health nuts he was kind of a health nut you know so i had to go along with him cuz i was really raised in the valley we would have hamburgers and french fries you know <laughs> i had to switch my my uh mode of uh, but i did i adapted i adapted to the health it's he was much more rigid and how he took care of himself, but he was also 18 years older, you know, so it makes, it makes sense. We do pay more attention to how we take care of ourselves as we get a little older. At least I did. Right. Wow. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. How was it like, when, when did he, um, when did he come to the U S permanently? Oh, so when he had the, the aha moment about products, 
because everything, every interview, I became, he brought me into the interviews. He brought me into the magazine stories or to the prom promotion or whatever. It just became like something that the two of us automatically fell into. And um, when he decided to, to come up with a, a line, there was no, there were, there were shampoos and that was pretty much it. There was nothing that was a, com a comprehensive line of cleansing the hair, you know, moisturizing it, sealing and protecting the hair. It was all a bottle of shampoo. And so he created a line that um, was consistent with healthy lifestyle, healthy hair, because it's a reflection of who, how we feel and how we, you know, our wellness. Um, and that was, that was pretty exciting. We actually started working in the United States with a company at first with Redken. Oh, really? Because if oh. you remember, I said that, that we had Charles of the Ritz, that Charles of the Ritz owned a third of Vidal's name in, in, so he couldn't do anything without asking their permission. When he said to them, I would like to start a line of products, they said, we're not interested. Mm. And then he said, what would it take? Because I was I was at that meeting. He said, what would it take to, to buy back my name so I can do my own thing? And the gentleman, the, the head of Charles of the Ritz, and it sounds funny now because it was such a long time ago. I said, well, I think they came to some kind of an agreement that it would take $650,000 to buy Vidal's name back over a period of five years. And that's a lot of money, especially when you don't have it. You know, we, we had nothing. We didn't have a car. We didn't have, we had a one bedroom apartment. In New York, we had a TV and a bed and then eventually a crib, you know, right. um, so we got an somehow got an a, arrangement to work with Redken, you know Paula Kent, obviously. You guys are in the hair business, you remember Paula. And she booked shows all around the world with Vidal's team of people and Vidal. And I would go much of the time in Japan and in different countries to teach the trade on behalf of Redken. So, um, and then Vidal would get paid a percentage of the gate and that money would come in and then he'd give it right over to Charles of the Ritz for the money that we owed him for buying his name back. And um, it was a, it was a struggle. There was one point and yet every quarter you had to make a certain payment in order to keep the Charles of the Ritz deal going, you know, and you, it was a lot of stress. So you, you, um, you don't make a payment, the deal's gone. Whoa. So one time we were $5,000 short and we borrowed from my mom and dad, which, you know, they just lived in a little house in Burbank. And like I said, my dad worked in a factory. So it was, and they were totally willing to do it. And they kind of had a, a stake in the success of where it went from there. They sure did. I, I mean, wow, that, that's great. It, it's so crazy to think about because like, like I opened up the podcast, like you only think of like Vidal as, as, as the legend, right? Like, like, like we, when we, we talked to Trevor Sorby a few years ago and um, Trevor was talking about the impact that Vidal's had. And his quote was that if you've ever held a blow dryer in your hand, you've been influenced by Vidal Sassoon, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, to think about, that guy and to think that there's not a person there's not a hairstylist today that doesn't like you know that 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 lineage isn't true right like right. That, that 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 they hold actual blow dryers you know and then to think that um you know that that you know you had to borrow five thousand dollars from your parents which you know i i definitely have you know when my parents were alive i i definitely had to borrow five thousand dollars from them at the same you know and that yeah. it, it's just it's it's just a weird it's it's a cool to me it's a cool and a weird connect that that e even even at that like you know he was still struggling um in, in it was you know we had that when we first moved to new york i mean if, if you think about it he changed a lot of things about the hair industry not only did he change the styles but he changed the technique of cutting and that was the big thing so the technique of cutting then brought on 
all the other, the short scissors, the blow dryers, women were sitting under those big things, you know, and the back combing and all, and that was all gone. So, I mean, he changed everything about it. Um, so even men's cutting, you know, because he changed the way that, and, and the fact that women and men could have the haircut in the same place, that was illegal up until he came along and he fought like hell to get it so that men could come into this. I don't know what, I don't know what that was about, but seems silly at the time, you know, it was, but we, we, we were in New York and everybody thought we had this incredible, you know, life and, and we did. Um, but it was a little different than, than it appeared. You know, uh, I had a, a black dress, one black dress kind of long and we get invited to these functions to go to these fancy functions in New York. And my hair always looked good, you know, so that was good. And my, I could do my makeup and I had this dress and different like shawl or wrap. And we had a friend that was a jeweler in New York, a man named Arthur King. And he had a jewelry store on, on Madison Avenue. And he used to send over jewelry from his shop the night that we were going out. So one of his guys would would bring stuff over and oh I go oh that's pretty and I put on this one and I put this one and I put a ring and I and I now I'm just really done you know and then at midnight I'd come back and there that guy would be with his tray and I'd take off my earrings <laughs> and put them back and there's a bracelet um, and then it would happen again the same dress but different jewels. So it was kind of, people thought we were eccentric because we walked everywhere. We didn't have money to take taxis, you know? What? So it was, it was a, it was a fascinating time when we were, we were young. So that was, it was exciting. You don't think anything terrible's going to happen. Although I know he's stressed about it um, probably a lot more than I did. Cause I was, you know, you kind of think everything's going to be okay. Right. When you're a kid. Were you still acting at the time? I was, but then I started getting pregnant. And so I, I had the first two babies were 15 months apart. Our, our daughter, Katya, was born in 68 and Elan was born in 70. And then, then we had two more after that. So but the roles for pregnant women were not, <laughs> they were few and far between. <laughs> Even still. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, and then I realized that my real home was was doing, you know, this was our life with us, you know, Vidal and I together and doing that. We would tour on buses. We were like an like a rock band, you know. I mean, we had all these guys who were kind of really crazy looking that the hairdressers, you know, the the long hair and the top hats and stuff. And we did. We looked a bit rockish, you know, traveling around the country on buses. But it was uh, it was a fun time. It's fun to be part of someone's dream and watch it become a reality. That's so wow. incredible. How, how was you, you mentioned that you thought that he was stressed out or that he was stressed out. Like how did he handle stress? He um, would get up in the middle of the night and when we were in New York, he would pace and he would, and he used to do a thing like when he would be thinking, he did a thing like this with his hands. Like it was almost like he was stretching out the tension or the pressure and he would walk and he'd walk and he'd think at night and I'd get up and I'd go check on him and see if he's okay. And he'd go, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Um, but he did that in a lot of different instances. You could see it, you could feel it. And then eventually, I don't think anybody knows this, maybe the, our kids do. He had to have an ulnar nerve transplant the nerve from here to here on both arms because <laughs> number one, he was using his hands nonstop when he was cutting and he was so intent on his work. Right. And then I think that's what happened with the, with the stress too. So he had scars kind of going up, you know, both arms. Um, I think now that would probably be, be a minor procedure, but in those days, it was a big deal, right? Yeah, it was. Um, so that was pretty much, he had a, an anger, you know, he got, he got, um, over the edge easily. 
And so, but then it went away, but it was scary. Like and anybody who knew him knows that. It was I'm not like, saying anything. It was like an outburst and then he was able to like just recoup himself. Mm-hmm. But it was, whoa, look out. <laughs> And he, he was a tough guy. He was in the Israeli army, you know, he didn't, he didn't take any, he was, he expected a lot from people because he expected a lot from himself. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think sometimes where the, he was married four times. <laughs> so that, you know, I said to him one day, I, you keep going, you're going to get it one day. <laughs> I, you know, he laughed. <laughs> but no other kids. He had no other children other than just ours. And same with me. But um, yeah, he was in, he was intense. And the, the kids, when the kids were little, I don't I didn't think that they understood because a lot of the times the rage was kind of directed towards me. Um. Or sometimes towards them, you know, but they didn't understand that. I knew as they got older that they would understand that that's, that's who he was. Um, I think I mentioned our oldest daughter passed away. Mm -hmm. And um, there are, obviously, you guys know, there are different reasons for drug abuse or or tendency towards addiction it could be you know a genetic thing or a predisp genetic predisposition or a situational thing and, and and whatever it was she got it in spades and she was um she died when she was 33 from a lethal dose of dilaudid her her addiction was pills and I think as she was beautiful she was stunning. She was funny. She was talented, but she was never good enough. And I think part of that came from, if you don't look good, we don't look good. That's a lot of pressure to put on a kid. Yeah. Was that, was that just living up to like that, the, that slogan or that, that motto or, or, or you don't look good. Was that, was that pressure from Vidal kind of having to live that as well? that yeah both both and um you know if, if your weight will have to be a certain you have to be a certain weight um and and that would fall over to even my friends I had one girlfriend that I uh, would come over and hang out and she was a psychologist we went to college together and she'd come out and, and over and Vidal would you're putting on a little weight, Irene, you know, you're getting a big ass. And I thought, oh, don't <laughs> say that, you know, is that not, but that was the kind he, he was, and with the kids, you know, he was hard on them. And um, our daughter ended up with a, an eating disorder. You know, that's a tough one. And I'm not blaming it on him because I had my share of the, of the, the fault or, you know, as well. And I kind of disappeared because I didn't, there was a lot of um, judgment. And so I just thought, well, I don't want to hear this. So I just won't hear anything. And I began drinking. Mm. But um, I've been sober since 1985. A long while. Thank we'll you. Celebrate that. I actually, in all fairness, I had a a break when our daughter died. I went, oh, but there's no no reason for me to be sober now. I think I'll just go off the you know rails. But I've been back for ten years, so well, welcome a, back. Thank you. Yeah, it feels it feels good. And Vidal didn't understand the issue of of addiction. Although his brother, I think it would be fair to say, died from, uh, and he was a very successful man, very successful. And yet, I think Fidel and his brother were really hurt because they were, their mother put them in an orphanage when they were little boys. Fidel was five and his brother was three. And that has to be 
damaging. Yeah, I was going to, well, I was going to, when you mentioned his brother, I was going to phrase it differently, but like you said that he was very successful. And I was like, you know, how often do you have two kids that are, were raised in an orphanage or not, and not two random kids, like two siblings that were raised in an orphanage together. And both of them were successful, but you know, I mean, I don't know what drives success. I mean, with some people it, it is because of, of that. I mean, even, even the brother, maybe you saw Vidal's uh, uh, success and had to, uh, to step up you know, his, his success game as well. I mean, I don't know who knows. Would you I think, I think mom kind of just so idolized Vidal. I mean, it was like, there was no other kid, you know? And because when they took him out of the orphanage, the brother was smart. And so he was allowed to go on and continue with school. He was school smart. Vidal, they took him into a salon and asked, gave him a broom and said, here, when you sweep the floors and wash this woman's hair, you know, so they didn't expect much from him, but he did really well. And his brother was going, whoa, look what's happening over there. And I'm working real hard here, you know, but he took it out in, in different ways. He it was a combination of maybe, and he was a great guy, you know, and he had two great kids, um, combination of, of, overeating, over drinking, over smoking, and died at a young age. Mm. You know, so as as fanatic as Vidal was about bean sprouts and wheat germ, mm. you know, his brother was the other way. Otherwise. It's a colorful story, don't you think? <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, you, you mentioned that Vidal was like a tough guy. Did, was, was he willing to like go to fisticuffs and stuff? Oh, my God. Yeah. Are you kidding? If there was, um, okay, for, I know when he was a kid, when he was like 17, 18, you know, it's like around wartime, you know, like World War II. Let's see, he was born, I think, in 28. So around, the, there were, there was a lot of problems anti-Jewish. He was Jewish, you know, and anti-Jewish in everywhere. And there were street gangs of Jewish kids that would go out and, you know, fight the, literally fight in the streets against the fascists. And he was one of them. He'd get out there and, and he'd be arrested and dragged into jail, you know, but that was the tension. It's kind of not dissimilar from some things that go on today. You know, the, the anger and the, the religious issues and whatnot, people getting riled up. You know, so yeah, he he definitely, and then he was smuggled out of England through France into Israel because you couldn't just leave a country and go join another country's military. Oh, so this is before he joined the uh, Israeli army. Yeah, he joined. I think he joined the army when he was like eighteen. So right around that that time, he thought he was he was doing hair. Didn't have much else going on in his his life. I mean, I heard these stories thousands of times because we traveled and then we did the books and we did. So I'm only repeating because I wasn't, I wasn't there in those, those years. So then after he served in the Israeli army, then he just went back to England. He did. He said that he, he was in the Negev, you know, in the desert. And he used to tell the story about thinking, what am I going to do? I don't have anything. I'm going to go back to sweeping floors. And, and he said that he had like this aha moment while he was in the desert. And I thought, I hate hair. I hate the way it looks. I hate the way it feels. It's not sexy. And then somewhere along the line came, well, why not? I could change that by the way I cut it. And so his concept was, Cutting hair like it's fabric, like designers cut fabric to fit to the shape of a body. He wanted to do that to the shape of a head. And that was, you know, as he used to say, that was something that that he thought about then. And he was, in, I think, in the Negev in about a year and then went back to England and said, OK, I got to I got to do something here. And that's when people were, what's he doing? He's like weird geometrical asymmetrical haircuts you know people thought that was strange but you either loved his work or you hated it and that was a mark for success you know that's pretty cool 
You know, that's pretty cool that it kind of it almost happened as, as a dream in a way or, or, or mm -hmm. as an epiphany almost. Yeah, like, exactly. And just like, what am I going to do? I'm going to change the world. I'm going to change the world. Yeah. yeah. I don't think he went quite that far. But he did it. It was just it was just a wild, wild ride, you know? So as 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 two men that are sitting here at the table, like I know that, um, and I'll speak for you, but correct me if I if if I overstep. But um, you know, the most humbling moment of my life was the first time that I held my daughter in the hospital. Um, how was um how was Vidal like the first time that he held Katya? God, he was because he was an older father. You know, I mean, he was thirty eight when we got married. I think you know, right around there. So we had, I think, he was forty when Cat was born. Oh, it was the cutest, cutest, cutest thing ever. And he was an amazing dad. And he had a connection with her that because the first child, you know, we lived in New York and he was he was good with all the kids. He would bathe them. He would get up at night. He would he was really a good dad. He would get weird and crazy, little, you know, at times, but not when they were infants. But he was he was great. He'd come home in the middle of the day. And he'd put Cat on his shoulders and they'd go to the park and she'd, she'd say, um, I want a boon, Dad, a balloon, right? Because Daddy, let's go get a boon, you know? And there they went off to get boons, you know? And it was just the greatest visual. Um, I, I broke his heart, I'm, I'm sure, you know, when things went rough. And I don't think we had the the wherewith, and we were divorced, obviously, when, when she when she died, but it's, it was hard, you know, but he, you know, he, she was sick as anybody who has an addiction, it's an illness and you can't blame them. You can, you can blame them for not doing what they can to get well, but you can't blame them. It's not the person, it's the disease. And I don't know that he totally understood that because it seemed to be all around him, you know, his, his brother, daughter, me. And so I was the only one left to be pissed off at, you know, at times. So it's okay. It's okay. And, and, and my, our other kids too are Eden, my daughter, well, Eden's been sober for a number of years. She went in and out. She's in, she's back in the program now. She's, she's incredibly powerful speaker when it comes to speaking about sobriety i don't know you must have touched on that somewhere we touched on it a little bit um uh, uh during the podcast and um yeah for sure i mean is 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 the next phase of the sassoon legacy do, <laughs> do, you think, do you think do you think it's like sobriety and the conversations around that uh it has to be to some extent because look we lost cat you know i had my issues i never didn't my issues were I grew up looking at the movies, seeing the actresses with the martini glass and the cigarettes. And I thought that was just the coolest, you know? Well, it was the coolest. Let's not, it, it was. was the coolest, right? Yeah, I wanted to be her. And then I got carried away, <laughs> you know, but you have to be able to handle, and there are just some genes. I mean, there's some people that have the genetic predisposition and you see it throughout families, you know? So yes, it was in my family, mom's side, dad's side, but my parents, no. But um, so I don't know. I think it could be a conversation. My my young uh, David, my youngest son, is um, he went through his own issues and and worked as a rehab counselor, and then Eden, you know, went through her stuff and is very very uh, open uh, about her issues and and about re her recovery, which is all that you can do because that's that helps people if you share how you did it you know and you don't always have to be perfect but it's a process so maybe i have we have another son who just never just never drank didn't smoke just kind of wasn't his thing so did anybody um did any of the kids want to pick up his legacy i mean get into the family business or yeah i get asked that a lot no <laughs> no <laughs> Because how are you going to be better? You know, you don't want to do it as like 
and also ran, you know, or you don't want to be an assistant for the rest of your, I mean, you, you're going to do something. It's going to have to be better than what he did. Right. You know, it's, they didn't, he, and he, he never, he never pushed it. Uh, Elan, my oldest son did go, he and I had a, a, a business where we had a product business, skincare products and, and, when I got divorced, I was not allowed to use the Sassoon name um, for any human hair care products. You, you could I do did. dog? You could do a I dog did. line? I did. I did. Oh, well, you're no. out of fast. I did a line of pet care products for QVC. It was so much fun. Well, they said human, so I took them <laughs> off. I love it. No right challenge this Polish girl. That's all right. <laughs> Your dog don't look good. <laughs> yeah, well, wolf. You know, you're just a dog. Um, I remember. Do you remember Bob Eubanks? Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, Bob was a friend of mine from the time I was a teenager, and he was so funny when I was doing this um, this pet care line, and he'd say, "How about you have you name the line V Dog Sassoon?" <laughs> you know, uh, I think that's okay. not going to sit well. He said, you could do a, a vitamin supplement called catatonic. You know, I mean, he was just goofy. He was, he's, he was a lot of fun. So he, but we did have products and, and had a nice couple of years run on, on QVC and, you know. That's what, amazing. What, when, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm strictly going from memory from 40 years ago. Like what was the, didn't Vidal like send a cease and desist to like Sassoon brand jeans or something? Wasn't there some like, Oh yeah. He sent it to everybody. Me too. At one point after we got divorced, I got, I got one. Don't, you can't work using the name. I went, wait a minute. Yes, he did. There was a company, anybody that had a name that remotely sounded like Sassoon or Sasson or Sasson. And there was the company that was run by the Gez brothers. I think they're uh, were out of Morocco, French Moroccan. And they had a man, they had the line of Ula La Sassoon, you know, and it was spelled S-A-S-S-O-N with that to make it look like it was an O-O-N, uh -huh. you know, and that little saying, and it was right around the saying at the same time, like, if you don't look good, we don't look good, you know? And so all those things were coming out and everybody thought they were also Vidal, you know, the, the jeans and the, and finally his company said, we got to stop it because they're, they're capitalizing off of Vidal's celebrity. So anything that we, we did television shows, we had our own show for quite some time. We wrote a book on health and beauty that went to number 10 on the, no, it was, number, it was the third best-selling book in the United States in 1976. So health and beauty. Whoa, that's... And, and, um, and so the, the other people were, were, you know, getting sales off of that. So he said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. So he, he, he stopped them. But the reason they were doing it is that they actually had a man working in their back room this is what i found out later they had a man working in the back room that his name was i want to say morris sasson s-a-s-s-o-n so they took the liberty of saying they had somebody in the company you know that was but the court they're gone you don't see him anywhere uh, yeah you no, know I, yeah. Um, 90% of the people listening don't even remember Sassoon jeans, <laughs> you know? No, no. I, well, I, you know what people do remember, which is strange, even now, not so much younger people, but people my age and a little bit younger, remember the brown bottle and the uh, smell, the, the scent, the almond scent of the shampoo. That's a kind of a, an interesting thing for people to remember 50 years later, you know? A well, fragrance is like, I, I know you smell stuff. It takes you right back to childhood or right back to like an event or something. Yeah. There's something about smell and memory. That's like a, that, that, that works together. Right. Well, look behind me. What color is my wall? Can you yeah, tell? Brown. Uh -huh. <laughs> Sassoon brown. In my office. Yeah. I thought that, that would be fun. I thought, you know, what? we, we, ha I haven't had a Brown room and I moved recently. I went, went from the, the house to the condo phase. So I thought, why not have a brown room? I love it. 
How was your how was your and Vidal's uh, relationship after um after you got um separated? Or we what? were we were really it was really good with the wife after me. You know, we got along fine. They'd have Christmas dinners and my they'd ask my mom and dad to come over and everybody would get together. And then he married a woman after that, a fourth one, fourth lady. Um, and everything stopped. All communication stopped with the kids, with me, with everything. And she was tough. Um, I don't, I don't say bad things about her, but that's one person I'm not fond of. Mm. You know, and she was really mean to my daughter. Uh, well, eventually, all, she has nothing to do with any of the kids. She was the last man standing, you know, so she got lucky. Right. Did, did your mom say, uh, I told you so? <laughs> <laughs> no, she was way on my team by then. <laughs> <laughs> team Beverly. <laughs> yeah, there was a team. I don't know. It's just a, like, I don't, I don't want to be on any. I met somebody after that and got married. He was amazing. I was married a second time. So did, I was. You, when you remarried, were, were, did you keep the Sassoon name? Well, it had been my name since 1965, 66, 66. According to the internet, 66. Right. Yeah. yeah. I was 21 when I got married and I was, I would have been, and I got married a year after, I mean, I, yeah, I was, we, so 45, I would have been 20 and 21 would be 46. Okay. All these, and I forget kids' birthdays too now. Grandkids are deep out of luck because I'm I'll text you mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, 66, February. And um, why were we talking about that? Wait a minute. What happened to us? How did you when, keep the name? Did what? you keep the name after you got oh, name, oh, Okay, so that was my name when I was working. And plus, I was sued by the company to stop using the name. And it became a... a a thing um, publicly, some women's organizations got involved and said, wait, she was okay to be the mother of your kids. She was okay to be the spokesperson for your company. She, you know, because I was legally and I was working with the board of directors and, and, but now she's not okay to have that name. What, what happened? I mean, so you're just going to pull it back. And, and so I said, I had to work and that was my name for since 66. That was a long time. Yeah. I mean, and so we did, we did go to court, but this was the best. So we finally go to court. And, and um, if you can just picture a courtroom and over here, you know, it's a judge up in front and over here, are all these high profile lawyers with big briefcases, you know, and they're all in their Mercedes and their Rolls Royces are out in the parking lot and over here is my side of the room and I've got a lawyer and a girl that was working like an assistant and my mom and dad <laughs> and me <laughs> and over there is like 50 people there was like four um but the judge said you know I don't care if she puts her name on tires he said but I do agree you know that we should stay away from the human hair care business and that's and that's how, but they named it, they, they listed everything, including bows and barrettes and that they didn't want me to touch. And they watched me over those years. I got lots of letters, even after the company sold to Procter and Gamble saying, oh, oh, we saw you do an infomercial with Jose Ebert. Don't talk about hair. Don't and talk about hair. I mean, you're a person. And I'm telling you. Wow. Oh my gosh. But you know what? I'm, I was so blessed when I when I got married again. And he finally said to me, "You do not need to work." And I'm like, "Okay, I like that. Yeah. I like nice. that." So now you don't yeah. let, now you don't have to misrepresent the Sassoon name anymore. No, but what happened is that his last name was Neil, and he was the head of a company called Avery Dennison. Not All the office office supplies, pens, pencils. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Paper, every. Anything that's sticky, the sticky stuff on band aids, the sticky stuff on like the label, pants. like the printing labels. You know the printing labels that we use in the print. Every everything, Avery. So it was a it was a worldwide company, and 
So after we got married, I said, I kind of feel weird. We're two people in our 60s traveling together and I got one name and you got another and we were married. So I said, I'm going to change my name. He said, but you get better reservations when you call a restaurant with Sassoon. <laughs> with that hairdresser name. Yeah. And I said, no, I'm going to. So I did. I went to court and I changed my name everywhere. Bank account, passport, da -da 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 -da, everything. And three months later, my husband passed away. Oh. And now if I call somebody, I go, this is Beverly Neal. Nobody knew who the heck I was. It was like, who? <laughs> <laughs> and so I couldn't even get in to see my own doctors, you know. It oh was, no! So I had to. I changed it back because it had become something of, of at sixty something to start over. It was like, oh, it was difficult. Yeah. Oh, so sure. that was kind of how I was identified for more than half of my life. You know. Well, I'm, I'm glad we can name the podcast Beverly Sassoon because if we named it Beverly Neal, I mean, <laughs> I know, see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, he was such a wonderful guy, but even he appreciated that. Yeah. Uh, well. That's funny. Hey, uh, uh, I, have, I have so many more questions, but, uh, but you can cut us off at any time. Um, what was uh, what was uh, what was Eric Estrada like? I'm sorry, he was cute. He for was, the record, he, like uh, Beverly almost choked on her water. Water, yes, <laughs> <laughs> like spew. He was great. This was obviously after Vidal and I were divorced. That Eric and I were together about three years, maybe, um, at the height of his Chips series. You know, two of our friends, a friend of his and a friend of mine, decided that we should meet as we were both divorced at the time. And so they set it up and that we were together from that dinner that night on. Um, and the, the, the rags, the newspapers, you know, kind of went bonkers because there was Eric, who's kind of this rough, sultry Puerto Rican kid, you know. And I went from Vogue magazine to the National Enquirer in about a week. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out. It was a, it was a fun time, you know. We're still friends. Um, he's a good he's a good guy, and he's married married to. This, same woman now for a lot of years, beautiful daughter, and just a couple of sons. Yeah. It was definitely colorful. Right. That, I mean, yeah, I just kind of think about it, like you said, like during the height of chips, like you were literally like the other woman when everybody else was like, you know, drooling over the legend of a, a yeah. Era, right. God, I didn't think of myself as that, but I was You were the was, other woman to the rest of America. That was, oh my, I'm lucky I'm still alive. <laughs> I'm lucky somebody didn't kill. Priscilla used to tell me stories like that. She'd say, there were so many women hanging around their house. She said, I felt like I was, my life was in jeopardy sometimes. She said, I was married. And yet that they were like, they were so mad at her because anything that she would do or say that, that they didn't like. And I thought that's, Mine, mine wasn't that extent, <laughs> not at all. That's a lot of pressure, though, isn't it? You know, yeah. to be Priscilla. I, oh. can't, I, I can't even imagine being Priscilla. You know, like just, just the, just all that pressure. I, yeah. I, you know, it, it's, I, I don't either. And there are times when I think you get a kind of. I remember the night that her daughter died, and the helicopters. I was sitting here, and when she was coming home from the hospital. And the helicopters were outside circling. And I thought, man, they don't, they didn't leave her alone. Mm -mm. You know, eventually it, it went away, but it's hard. It's hard to have because it's, you, everybody has stuff in our lives. You know, we got all kinds of stuff. But then when you have that kind of le level of visibility that she has, it becomes the world's stuff. Mm. And it's really nobody else's business, your pain, you know, but. I mean, I think about that a lot, actually. One, I'm so grateful that, like, I grew up without social media, but, you know, but, but Priscilla yeah. didn't have that. Priscilla did grow up with, like, you know, it wasn't, like, the same social media that we know, but it's it's still the social media. I mean, you too. I mean, both of you guys were so young and, like, anything, anything and everything that you did got highlighted beyond what it probably should have been. You know, yeah, we're the same age. We get such a kick out of it. She's a couple months older. 
<laughs> so, Priscilla's older, for the record. <laughs> uh, she's the best. I said she has. I always tease. I said you have a smiling voice. You know, when you talk to her on the phone, her voice is always smiling. Which you think sometimes some of the stuff that she's been through with her grandson and her daughter and everything, it's hard to smile through it, you know. But I've, I've never seen. I've never seen it otherwise. You know, she's a good girl. That's amazing. That is amazing. Beverly, thank you so much. We just flew through like an hour and a few minutes. I mean, it's, it, it was in, you know, we it's opened this. We opened this regular up. chatty Kathy, huh? No, oh, no, no, love no. This, that's the kind of podcast we, we love. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like we opened it up saying like, we just want to have like a conversation in a pub and that's exactly what we did. And, and I just appreciate the time. And, and, and if we can ever do this again, we'll do it in a second because that was just so, so easy. You're so sweet. And you guys are great. I know, I, I know people can see you because your video as well. Next time, I would like to have makeup and hair, please. I mean, <laughs> well, let me give you my card. Hey, Beverly. No, so. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna, well, I have to get up and do my face. No, nah, exactly. you, you look amazing. I, I need to ask you that question because I've been thinking about it the whole time. Like, it must be a nightmare for you to get a haircut. Oh, I've been going to the same guy for like 30 years. And I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I think I, I just would like it as little hair as possible. And now that I let it grow natural, like you guys have, you know, I love it. I love this. People watching have got to be just totally enamored because there's a warmth that comes out of the two of you. I don't know what I expected, but thank you because you just, you've got to be hugely success successful because you can feel it and people have to be able to feel it. Well, we're gonna we're gonna put that on our resume everywhere. You know, the I feel you do. You're warm and you're kind and you're funny and you you just kind of want to talk. So hello, hello, oh, hello. Bring oh, on a chat at Kathy. Tony, would you be nervous about cutting her hair? Yeah, it's Beverly Cecilia. <laughs> <laughs> no steps. Right, I don't no like steps. steps in the back. <laughs> no steps. No steps. Oh no, Tom Brophy is the guy who cuts my hair. He's here and very he's a British guy. And I adore him, but I do give him some problems. Hmm? Yeah, you give him some problems? Well, after 30 years, I go in, I go, I don't like this little thing here, Tom. What are we going to do? And he's like, I've been saying this every month for like, you know, but, or let's make it all go back or spiky. And it's like, you don't have a lot to work with because I keep it really short. But what would it be like if I didn't have a comment to make? And I could never, I Vidal cut my hair three times. Whoa, 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 wait, hold on, what? I thought we were three just times. out of this conversation. No, we're not. How did he only cut your hair three times? Well, okay. So one was for a photo shoot and we went to the shoot and, and he put this long hair piece on. It was in the back. It was this long thing. And I thought, oh, this is fun. I'll leave it on. And we were going out that night. It was in, in England. <clears throat> and we went out that night and it was windy and rainy. And this thing that was attached to the back of my hair blew off you know, <laughs> down the street. And we were like, I, I can't go into a dinner party like this. What'd you do to me? You know? <laughs> I mean, so that was one. And then, I, then there was another time where we were in Japan with the whole team of people. And they were cutting and just doing amazing models on the stage. And this was 50 years ago during the Redken days. And these girls were just getting fabulous haircuts. And I had hair below my shoulders at the time. And I said, I want my hair cut. Oh my God, that's so gorgeous. I, I've had it with the hair. I don't want this long hair. And Vidal said, no, I've just listened to you for years complaining about letting it grow and how difficult it is. And I said, okay, if you won't do it, I'll ask one of the guys to do it. So he went, okay, sit down. <laughs> and in front of about 5,000 people, I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I see these long strands of hair going flying off in different directions. I thought, oh, there's no stopping now. I can't, I can't oh, oh, change my mind. You know? Who's punishing you on a stage? On a stage. And they it was it was actually it, they were doing something kind of tongue in cheek at the time called the the veil. Yeah. So it was long hair and it was really thin through here. So I could just see through. I mean, obviously that part disappeared after a while, but it was a huge success for the show because of what was going on underneath it, you know? 
And I, that must have been a third time. But I just realized that if I didn't like it, who was I going to complain to? Right, exactly. <laughs> I, okay. I'm going to call you and say, could you go give him hell? Because I, right, I exactly. don't like this haircut. <laughs> exactly. I, but can you imagine like in the, you were married for like 14 years or so, 14 or 15 yeah. years. Like, could you imagine like Beverly Sassoon's on your book and now you've got to go knowing that when you get home, that I was going to judge every <laughs> section that was taken. Right. Could you imagine? Oh, that's pressure. You probably never got. I had I had things done with color at times where the hair broke off because I wanted to do something crazy in the hair, and it, he just like, oh, okay, you know. <laughs> oh, but as a hairstylist, you would never think that. You would think that Vidal's going to go through the whole section, yeah. check out all the sectioning. Yeah, no, he 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 didn't. He was pretty easy going. I do I remember him making a comment after we were divorced, and and I'd gone let it grow silver right or platinum <laughs> as i call it right. and he sure. went wow he said i really like that i never thought you would do that and i said why not it feels good it feels empowering you know it's like freedom yeah and so he really liked that this move although i can't figure out what to do <laughs> hey next time you're next time you're in dc tony will uh, certainly cut your hair <laughs> well i have to you have to i have your information okay why why are you about you don't cut hair uh, uh, just color. Yeah, we've oh. been best friends since high school. So uh, that is so cute. So he colors, and I, I just cut. So could you color this part to get it to stand up? Can we color it to stand up? You cut it. Oh, it's, it's, it's when you have color on your hair, you can move it around a lot better. Yep. It's, it's getting so healthy. It's flat. It's, it's getting so healthy. <laughs> it is. A, silver hair is like it just shines. You know. But I will definitely, because I'll be coming to visit my granddaughter. Yeah, we're gonna um, have dinner too. We we'll definitely have dinner. Beverly, have you used the new um, like the like the powders? Like a lot of the barbers are using the powder, and it creates that texture right there the, where you. No, look at tell it. me. It's like a it's it's like a powder. It's kind of like it's like it's pump like, powder. Yeah, like pump powder. It's like it's really? not quite tacky, but it kind of gives the hair a little. It'll definitely stand your hair wherever you want it. Because uh, it just <laughs> flops. I, I use a, like paste. But then it's so nasty the next day. I got to start, you know, but that's, I didn't know about pump powder. I'm going to find it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. A lot of barbers use it. Um, Who, who has one that they swear by? Someone just came out with one that everybody loves. Is it, is it victory? Is it victory? I know, Matt, I know Tyler had, had Tyler had the pump. Oh powder. yeah. Tyler had one. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Beverly, here's what we're going to do is that I'm going to um, I'm going to ask around to some of our friends that are in the industry. who have let me out. know. No, I'm going to send you one. I'll get them to send you one. So um, I'll reach out. I'll get your address and we'll just. We'll just OK. Yeah, they're this really is cool. So exciting. They're fun to play with. They're, they're um, you're, I you're wanted fun. to I wanted to because it's got great. Sh my head is it's a good shape, but I want it to stand up. But it just is like <laughs> the powder's going to do it. The powder They'll will do it, it more than anything. Yeah. It's, oh, it's, I love it. You're stuff. bringing me up into the 2024. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. You guys are the best. Thank Beverly, you. You're the best. Thank you so uh, much. Really? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Miss Beverly Sassoon. Thank you very, very much for joining us on your day off. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends. Give us a rating and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.